Today's episode of Hidden Forces is made possible by listeners like you. For more information about this week's episode or for easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you listen to the show on your Apple Podcast app, remember, you can give us a review. Each review helps more people find the show and join our amazing community. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode. Predicting the future is a sport as old as civilization itself. Oracles and wishing wells litter the landscape of humanity's past. Yet in a world whose outcomes are determined not by the forces of nature, but by the whims and behaviors of an irrational lot, ordaining the future becomes a matter of market introspection. After decades of declining interest rates and aborted tightenings, markets have gone from Goldilocks to Wonderland. Impossible things are served before breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yield curves have learned to play possum. Assets have levitated. Volatility absconded as investors have lost Ariadne's thread and with it any sense of price discrimination. In their thirst for yield, they've drank the sand from a mirage of private placements, tech stocks, cryptocurrencies, corporate bonds, and emerging markets. Fugitive prices, in their quest for asylum, have sought shelter in the coffers of candidates and on the message boards of social media, emerging as populism and civil strife. This week on Hidden Forces, Jillian Tett, Markets, Tech, and the State of the Global Economy. Jillian, welcome to Hidden Forces. I'm delighted to be here. It's great having you on. I've actually wanted you on for more than a year. We met about uh, this time last year. Actually, it was in May, I believe, in 2017, and asked you to come on the program. And I persisted until you came on. And I think maybe you can tell me it's because I had a fellow anthropologist on the show, and you saw that, and you said maybe... Well, I'm keen to champion anthropology in all its <laughs> forms. So, yes, I think I need to be a lot more. I can't have too much anthropology in public life. <laughs> so I didn't know you were an anthropologist. I didn't know you had your PhD in anthropology. Mm-hmm. I learned that when I was preparing for the interview. Maybe you can give us a little bit of background. I mean, everyone knows you as, obviously, as the managing editor of the Financial Times U.S., but uh, you have a PhD in anthropology. Yeah, I have a completely weird background to be doing my job as running the editorial operations of the Financial Times, let alone someone who spent years of my life recently writing about finance and economics. I was originally trained as a cultural anthropologist, which means I was someone who went out to study social systems and cultural patterns um, all over the world. In my case, I went and did my PhD study originally in Tibet and then in a place called Tajikistan where I lived for about a year and a bit up in the high mountains studying marriage rituals amongst the Tajiks. That was actually back in the days of the Soviet Union, the last year of the Soviet Union. So I was looking a lot at how Islam and communism interacted and how they were expressed through the rituals of weddings, which would seem to be a million miles away from studying Wall Street or Washington or any of the big issues that consumes the media today. But I'd argue that actually they're much more connected than people realize. Well, I've heard you actually compare the derivatives group at J.P. Morgan Tajik uh, wedding ritual. Well, is that right? the <laughs> thing about looking at Tajik wedding rituals or any type of anthropology is you try and look at what makes human beings tick, not through looking at their minds, that's psychology, and not through looking at the economy, because that's economics, but really by looking at the cultural patterns and the social patterns that we all absorb from our surroundings without even noticing it. We're all creatures of our own social environment, but we never think about how those patterns shape our lives. And in Tajikistan, I was looking at the patterns that the Tajiks had inherited and which influenced how they behaved. The same thing's true of derivatives traders at J.P. Morgan or anywhere else. We're all social creatures influenced by tribalism and cultural frameworks we never normally think about. You know, when I was preparing for this interview, I was focused on what I want to talk about most, which is or I want to get your opinion about most, which is sort of this, the financial landscape going forward. But when I did that, I started getting sucked in to some of the articles that you wrote in 2007, 2008, and 2009. And I was very fascinated by the fact that you were covering this space prior to the crisis. And I'm curious, 
obviously no one could predict exactly sort of what was going to happen, right? Uh, all the, the various knock-on effects. But I wonder, A, what sort of drew you to this space? I mean, you were looking at credit default swaps for, I assume, for mortgages as well, not just. And what drew you to the space? And then also, to what extent prior to the sort of real panic of 08, were you able to piece together sort of a picture of what the landscape looked like and where the risks were and what sort of the knock-on effects could be on balance sheets of these instruments? Well, my story about the whole my involvement with the credit crisis and writing about credit derivatives actually started back in 2004 when I was running the Lex column of the Financial Times, which is a financial commentary column. And one day the editor came over and said to me, can you draw up a memo of what you should be writing about in the financial media? So I did the original normal memo saying, you know, three pieces a week about industry, two pieces a week about retailing or whatever. And then I thought, well, what would happen if I was to step back from my surroundings and imagine that I was an anthropologist who'd crashed into the city of London, and I was living in London at the time, or the Wall Street, pretty much the same. What would I see as an anthropologist arriving at this gigantic financial village? And if I was to do the kind of fieldwork or study I did in Tajikistan, which was literally going around the Tajik village, talking to people, trying to piece together what I saw, and comparing rhetoric with reality, comparing what people said they thought was going on with what was really going on, what would I see in the city of London? And I tried doing that exercise really just out of curiosity, and two things struck me. Firstly, that back in 2004, it was very hard to see how the financial system actually operated. There wasn't a roadmap showing you know, where all the money was flowing or anything like that. And then secondly, when I talked to people about what was really driving growth, it was completely different from what we were writing about in the media. And the media was writing about equity markets and currencies and sometimes government bonds. And what the bankers were frenetically excited about was derivatives and credit. So I wrote a memo saying, well, I think that the way the media is covering finance is completely wrong. And I called it the iceberg memo. And I said... It's Why the iceberg memo? Well, Because it crashed like an iceberg? <laughs> <laughs> no, if I'd known it was going to crash, I would look like a genius. Um, <laughs> sadly, that's not true. I thought it was like an iceberg because you had a little piece of the financial system poking above oh. the water, which was visible. And that was the equity market. And there was this massive great underbelly, which was credit and derivatives, which was largely being ignored and hidden. So I wrote the iceberg memo. I said we should cover it. I jumped up and down, made myself quite unpopular. And in why, the end, why unpopular? Well, because I was saying basically, you know, I don't think our coverage is quite right. Oh, that's interesting. No company likes being told it's got it wrong. I've noticed this about you. You don't shy away at all. I've watched your interviews. You're the best interviewer. I've seen so many, and you don't do them on television, obviously. You don't have a television show. You go to all these conferences, and you interview panels of people or individuals, and you're so excellent, and you're so direct, and you don't shy away from asking questions at all. So I would imagine that perhaps during that time, you didn't uh, shy away from uh, sort of raising these concerns at all at the FT. Well, I was a bit probably pretty outspoken about my thoughts. And what happened was I ended up getting moved off the Lex column and being sent to run the capital markets team, which at that time was definitely not a promotion. I was actually pregnant at the time, and a lot of people thought, oh, well, I've gone off to the mummy track. (laughs) Because it was so quiet? Well, Capital Markets was at the back of the paper, and it was pretty quiet. And in fact, one friend of mine said to me when I told her I was going there, she said, oh, that's a great place to go and have a baby, because nothing ever happens. This was a market section in 2005. But I went there, and it was like a gift from the heavens, in that I discovered that there was this huge, great, shadowy underbelly of the financial system that no one was writing about. And suddenly in the capital markets team, I was able to do that. Hmm. And then when 2008 occurred, at that point, were you able to quickly sort of piece together what was going on and the impact of all of these OTC derivatives on liquidity and sort of uncertainty in financial markets? I mean, were you ahead of the curve on that in terms of understanding it? Well, what happened was I arrived in the capital markets team in 2005 and started writing about the underbelly of the iceberg. And I originally did it because I wanted to provide almost like a travel guide for the FD readers to the strange new land. I actually thought it was very exciting what the bankers were doing. I wasn't particularly worried about a crash. I was more writing about it as a kind of sign of, wow, look at this innovation. innovation. Yeah. And then in 2005, by the end of it, I became seriously concerned about the risks. 
So I wrote a few pieces saying, look out, this is dangerous. Went off and had my baby. <laughs> Thought at the time I'm going to miss all the fun. There's going to be a crash while I'm off on maternity leave and I'll miss it. And I came back and discovered I was 180 degrees wrong, that actually the bubble had got even more big or even bigger while I was away. So then I thought, oh, well, clearly I didn't understand anything. These credit you know, derivatives and stuff are actually great. And for about six months, I thought I was wrong, that everything was fine. And then I began to think, no, actually, the system is crazy. I'm not crazy. The system is crazy. So then I issued a whole series of warnings in late 2006 and early 2007, and which turned out to be correct. Wow. So it was a combination of luck, being in the right place at the right time, and also, I would argue, a big dose of anthropology. How would you say that that experience changed you or, or informed who you are today as a journalist? Well, it taught me, I hope, enough humility to realize that often, as journalists, on a good day, we get 40% of the truth. What keeps me going is I think my competitors tend to get 35%. But we never know everything, and even when we think we're right, even when we're proven to be right, we're probably only partly right, and there's almost more things that we can learn. But the other thing it taught me is that the power of social silences is very important. And what I mean by that is when I was an anthropologist, an academic anthropologist, I was heavily influenced by the work of a French intellectual called Pierre Bourdieu, who argued that the way that an elite stays in power is not just by controlling the means of production, i.e. money, it's by shaping the way that we think. And what really matters in terms of that shaping is not what we talk about, but what we don't talk about. It's the social silences that are crucial. And as an anthropologist, you're trained to look what people don't talk about as much as what they do talk about. And in the case of finance before 2008, as I say, people were talking about the equity market. They weren't talking about credit derivatives. That was the social silence, mm. if you like. And I think as journalists, you know, our job is really to try and train ourselves to look at social silences and to explore them. And when journalism is at its best, we illuminate social silences in a way that makes the entire system much more transparent for everyone. What are people not talking about today? Not talking about pensions and the slow moving car crash that's there. I would say they're not talking about antibacterial resistance that's growing. Mm. Until quite recently, they weren't talking about the big issues in cyber security and the tech economy. One of the things I find fascinating is that if you look at the whole furore about Cambridge Analytica and Facebook and the tech companies recently, um, there's a huge amount of anger about the fact that tech companies have been taking data, which of course no one was talking about two or three years ago. But what people still aren't talking about there is actually what was going on in recent years, and it's still going on, is a pattern of exchange that can only be understood by anthropologists because it's not about economics in the normal sense that economists look at it. It's not about money. It's about exchange in a wider concept. I mean, anthropologists don't just look at the economy in terms of money. They look at it in terms of the exchange in the widest possible sense. And anthropologists spend a lot of time looking at credit in a very broad sense and barter. And the tech economy today is based off barter. So when tech companies collect data from us, they do so in exchange for services. And there's no exchange of money that takes place. Mm. It's a barter. But economists don't have a way of talking about barter. And ordinary people don't think about barter either way. So until now, no one's actually stood up and said quite openly, what's happening in the tech economy is a massive barter economy has grown up. And the real scandal is not so much that companies are taking data from us, but that people are getting services back for free and no one's actually talking about the terms of that exchange or making that transparent. That's so interesting. That's an interesting way of looking at it. So it's kind of like saying that tech companies have found this new source of wealth that wasn't uh, recognized before or able to be tapped. They've tapped into it and they're extracting it and that is going unregistered because there is no monetary exchange. It's not formalized. Absolutely. But at the same time, consumers are getting something back as well. And you have to recognize that if you're going to change the terms of that service, of that arrangement, you know, consumers will also be affected. And so the question of whether consumers have knowingly, willingly bought into that gigantic barter, how you measure it, how you record it in the GDP statistics, how you deal with it in antitrust law, because the whole basis of American antitrust is that breaches of antitrust are measured through consumer prices being too high. 
but in order to measure if consumer prices are too high, you have to have monetary exchanges. How do you measure antitrust in an economy where barter is very, very important? So I just cite that as one example of an area of social silence that until now no one's talked about, but has been crucial to the economy more widely. That's interesting. I mean, I've heard you a year ago or so say that Silicon Valley began to feel eerily similar to Wall Street pre-crisis. Not exactly the same, not as bad, you said, but it was beginning to feel somewhat like that. Do you still feel that way? And if so, why? Well, I started thinking that Silicon Valley was like Wall Street about three years ago, because what you had was incredible asymmetries of information. You basically had a bunch of technocratic geeks who were in control of processes that had the potential to impact us all in very powerful ways, but which almost nobody understood apart from the geeks. It's a whole area of the world that is basically driven by profit motives and where the regulators have got very little idea what's going on, where politicians and consumers don't have much idea of what's going on either. You know, not because the geeks are necessarily hiding everything, but because politicians and consumers until recently have thought that they were getting great benefits from Silicon Valley in the form of all these tech gadgets, cheap or free services. And they didn't want to rock the boat. They didn't see any need to rock the boat in much the same way that pre-2008 consumers in America didn't want to challenge the financial system because they were getting free mortgages. And cheap credit. Yeah, and cheap credit. So in both cases, you had essentially the geeks in a very, very powerful position, not just because they had the mastery of this technology, but you also had the rest of the world not interested in actually challenging them. So those were the parallels I saw between Silicon Valley and the financial crisis two or three years ago. And of course, on top of that, the geeks were becoming very, very rich and very powerful and full of hubris. I mean, Mm. what struck me going around Silicon Valley two or three years ago was just a level of hubris and arrogance and inability to see themselves as others might see them. And that was very, very reminiscent of Wall Street in Mm. 2007. So that now you feel like we were beginning to see some level of accounting by the public. But would you say that we're still in a sort of period of euphoria in tech? And I also wonder, when I was thinking about this, a few things came to mind. One was, or is rather, this culture of this infatuation with futurism in society. It's a sort of growing cultural trend. Also, the the economy itself has transformed itself a great deal. And so companies with technological acumen have a certain advantage over others. And so in that sense, and it's also, I think, difficult to properly value them. A lot of these also are private placements, right? And that's sort of another wave that uh, is feeding off of maybe the low interest rates and the redistribution of wealth. How much do all of those factors play and where do you attribute most of this? And are we, in your view, in a sort of bubble of sorts in technology stocks and in technology companies? I think that Silicon Valley has been dramatically overhyped. They do have control of technologies that are absolutely transformational. There's no question of that. But there's also a lot of mystique and a lot of hype around tech stocks right now. And for the most part, people don't really understand the threats that could be emerged further down the tracks to their supremacy. I mean, whether it's the risk of a splinter net emerging that basically breaks up the internet. So much of our vision of the future is predicated on the assumption that the internet remains a single coordinated global whole, which may not be the case. The challenges posed by Chinese companies, the chance of some technological you know, platform change upending a lot of the current models, or even the chance of, you know, a major cybersecurity hack and public trust in the internet, you know, beginning to crumble. All of those things could come in to actually undermine some of these stratospheric valuations that we see right now. But to me, the more interesting question is just this pattern that whenever you get a small group of geeks in control of a technology, which only a tiny number of people understand, but it, which affects everyone, and where there's a lot of money to be made you almost always get hubris, overreach, arrogance that eventually has a political backlash and rebounds on them. We saw that in finance and we're seeing it now in tech. There's also a kind of a cult worshipping factor that goes on. One place where I've seen that has been with Elon Musk, there's a strong showmanship that, that comes out with respect to the company. We saw, I mean, I'm, I'm reading John Carew's account, the Wall Street Journal reporter who wrote on Theranos, I'm reading his account of Elizabeth Holmes, also a strong sense of like self-awareness about 
presentation and appearances. And I feel like you've talked also about cryptocurrencies. I see that as well in cryptocurrencies. That gap between what the public understands and what the sort of entrepreneur or the people, the geeks as you call them, understand, that's exploited oftentimes yeah. at peaks, no? I mean, I don't think necessarily the geeks or the financiers or the techies are necessarily doing this as some kind of deliberate, stage-managed, carefully crafted plot at all. Not even a little bit in some cases. I think they certainly ride the wave. They know that it pays them well to basically present a front and to kind of, you know, concoct this magic. But I think what tends to happen is somebody has a good idea or gets intoxicated with a new technology or a new way of doing business and they start selling it to outsiders and selling it to themselves and they start to believe their own hype and then sell their hype to others. And then what happens is that the people selling this hype become so darn busy and they're scrambling to build this business. They're talking to people like themselves. They get caught up in their own bubble of achievement and success and they end up basically becoming very cocooned. And what struck me about the financial world before 2007 was the degree to which all the derivatives traders and other traders were scurrying frantically to do this financial business very successfully, but very much existing in a little silo of their own, where they talked to people like themselves, they took their reference points from each other. It was very self-referential. It became very easy within that closed system to really believe your hype. Also narcissistic. There was a tremendous amount of narcissism. I see that now also in Silicon Valley in a way that I didn't see in the past. You know, again, to bring back to this book on Theranos, which I'm currently reading, with respect to the CEO of the company, Elizabeth Holmes, there was her obsession, for example, in the way that it was chronicled with Steve Jobs, a microcosm for me of obsession with derivative, in a sense, that I hadn't seen before. Do you see that? I don't know if I see an obsession with derivative, but what I do see is a tendency amongst financiers like techies to start believing your own hype. And it's very hard to believe this now, but back in 2004, 5, 6, when I first started diving into the world of finance, there was an overwhelmingly dominant theory amongst the financiers that instruments like credit derivatives and the other innovations were going to make the financial system a lot healthier. They really believed it, or they rather, they told themselves they believed it. And they had these elegant theories about why financial innovation was good, to do with this idea that if you could liquefy markets, if you made every asset in the world tradable and liquid, you would then get the perfect pricing and the perfect allocation of risk in the system. And in retrospect, that whole intellectual framework seems crazy. It was riddled with contradictions you know, like the fact that the systems they were creating to distribute risk were introducing new risks in the system. But at the time, people seemed to half believe it. And going back to Bourdieu again, the French intellectual who I looked at as an academic, you know, he said that the most powerful truths are those which need no words, but merely a completion of silence. People just kind of agree to go along with something. And he also pointed out that you know, the most powerful cultural constructs are those which exist at the border of conscious and unconscious thought. They're the ideas and frameworks and justifications and stories that we tell ourselves, which we kind of just accept and don't really challenge very hard. And they're kind of convenient for us to believe or at least tell ourselves that we believe. So people in finance before 2007 had a cultural and an intellectual framework to justify what they were doing. And if you fast forward to Silicon Valley today, there's the same sense of evangelical, until recently, evangelical belief that bringing the internet to everyone could only be good, that the internet would connect everybody, that it would create a more transparent, egalitarian society. These were the kind of framings that people talked about. And on one level, they kind of believed it, just like people believed that bringing credit derivatives was going to make the financial system healthier. Indeed, but also I, I can't help but feel that there's a strong amount of self-interest and cynicism there because it serves their business models. And there's very lofty rhetoric. I actually saw a recent speech by Jonathan Haidt where he was at Berkeley's business school, and he sort of read the sort of mission statement of Berkeley. And uh, it was so lofty and sort of idealistic, and I think that's an interesting trend as well. Well, we all have in little lives in our own lives that we live with every day. And we all have unchallenged, you know, pieces of rhetoric that we just kind of quietly accept, even though if we sat down and deconstructed them, we'd probably think it's ridiculous. So none of us live such pure, intellectually consistent lives. 
But yes, Silicon Valley in the last five years has swayed itself in this evangelical rhetoric, which, you know, in many ways is completely contravened by what they're actually doing. And yet it's jolly convenient for them to wrap themselves in this language. And on one level, probably some of them believe it. And who knows, parts of it are actually maybe true. So, you know, to stick with that point about Silicon Valley and the earlier point about the private placements and the amount of money that has sort of piled into these companies pre-IPO, of course, there's a risk to all the investors there. Do you see any risk in that case for the broader economy? I think that if there was a big pop of the internet stocks today, we wouldn't see a 2007, 2008 credit crisis because it would primarily, at this point, affect equity markets and it'd be a private placement issue. It's not the case that these internet companies have taken out huge amounts of debt as they did in 2001 in quite the same degree that's going to sort of suddenly go pop and bring down a load of pension funds or anything else like that. So yes, it would be bruising, but I don't think we're going to see a 2007 crisis. What we are seeing or what we have seen signs of is, you know, for the private companies and of course much of the internet you know, whiz kids these days are actually private companies, they're still unicorns, not publicly quoted, is more like a great ooze where the projected, you know, by that I mean we're not seeing a bubble go pop, we're seeing it go <laughs> ooze. Some of the air is just seeping out. <laughs> where essentially you've got, well, it's kind of, you know, the best way to see it because essentially what you've got is, is some of the backers of these big unicorns and others maybe just start marking down the value of their holdings a bit. So they come in at the BC series. That's sort of more in line with what we've been seeing, rather than a big market crash. Instead of the Great Depression, the Great Disappointment. <laughs> yeah, I think that's probably the way we're going to going to do it, and that'd be more elliptical. So another area I was thinking about, as I mentioned it earlier, and you kind of touched on it a little bit with the talk about unfunded liabilities, and that's just liabilities more broadly. Debt has grown, and has grown also as a percentage of GDP, but that's really, I think, neither here nor there. What really matters is the notional debt debt load, right? Because we go through these economic cycles. And there's some interesting sort of points that have come out of some papers I read. You've recommended to read the BIS report, which I read. Also a report by the Institute of uh, International Finance. And I pulled out some interesting points, primarily dealing with corporate debt. So it looks like corporate debt is one of the most concerning areas of global finance. What can you tell us about the debt landscape overall and sort of the way that debt markets have changed, particularly for corporates? Well, it is one of the most remarkable things that's happened in the last decade, that we had a debt-fueled crisis, a crisis in 2008, triggered by there being too much debt in the system. And after the crisis, nobody tried to cut the level of debt in a meaningful way. Debt has continued to go up and up and up. Most of the increase has been different from before the crisis. And before the crisis, the biggest area of growth were in areas just like mortgages. And this time round, it's been emerging markets globally, places like China and India, have seen corporate debt increase very rapidly. And But also in the US, corporate debt has risen quite fast and in quite a striking manner. So... The debt bubble this time is bigger than it was in 2008. It's different. If you're being optimistic, you say, well, it's less dangerous, that actually the system has got better buffers and you've got sort of, you know, companies able to pay back their debt loads for the most part and because they've got good earnings. And you can argue that the Chinese debt bubble, which is the thing that many people worry about, the Chinese debt bubble is simply backed by the government. So it's fine. You know, people say that. I was meeting earlier today with people like Ben Bernanke, who would argue that, you know, basically that makes debt different from last time. But if you're being pessimistic, you say, well, history shows whenever you get debt going up and up and up, something nasty would eventually happen. Well, indeed. But also, it seems that our global capitalist system, the way it operates today, requires ever more amounts of debt in order to continue to grow. So are we not sort of just caught in this vicious sort of repeating exponential loops until there's a point at which there's a sort of finite time singularity and there needs to be some type of reset? Well, there's two ways of looking at the fact that debt keeps growing. And if you look at any chart over the last century, you can indeed see that debt to GDP keeps going up and up and up and up. One way to look at it is say that debt basically is the new electricity that drives the global economy. And the fact we have more and more debt is simply the fact that we have a bigger and bigger financial system that's more complex and sophisticated 
and we shouldn't worry about it. It's just a sign that there are more transactions happening in the world. Another way of looking at it is to say, well, what's really going on is a system, a global economic system, where there's no constraint on how much credit can be, can be created. And because there's no constraint, it's just going to keep going up and up and up until there's a social explosion or some kind of political safety valve is created. And there's a very good anthropologist called David Graeber who wrote a book called Debt, The First 5,000 Years, who said if you look back at history, basically monetary systems fall into two categories. They're either constrained by being tethered to something tangible and finite, like gold, or they're unconstrained and they're just dependent on people trusting each other. And for a while, America was on the gold standard and that constrained the amount of money. Today, the global system is based on an unconstrained system. And David Graeber said, if you look back at history, when you get unconstrained systems, what happens is that credit gets bigger and bigger and bigger until you have such extremes of social relations and inequality of power that an explosion happens. Or you create some kind of debt forgiveness mechanism. A debt jubilee. A debt jubilee, yeah. A write-off, you know, debt forgiveness. Or a default. A default is basically a debt forgiveness mechanism but right. in the most brutal way and if you want to know where the phrase wipe the slates clean comes from it comes from Mesopotamia the which, pharaoh well it was the first society to ever create a safety valve mm. where in Mesopotamia they had credit creation which was unconstrained it wasn't te- the lending was never tethered to anything tangible or finite and so every I think it was every 50 years the pharaoh or person in charge would actually physically decree that all the clay tablets listing the debts would be literally wiped clean and everyone would start again. Hmm. So we're now in a period of tightening, right? The global central banks, starting with the Federal Reserve, are trying to unwind their balance sheets and trying to do it in a way that's not going to wreck the economy and trying to do it in a way where they have, quote, firepower in the event that there's another crisis. We talked about corporates. There's uh, a record number of bonds coming due in about five years or so, right? Mm-hmm. And they're going to need to be rolled over. Banks, because of regulations, have had to curb back their lending. There's restraints on what they can do. And uh, sentiment can always change. And on top of that, global governments are even more burdened with debt. Populations are aging in developing economies. Even in China, we have roughly the same, I believe, demographics as the Chinese. How do we sort of confront this and... What are the challenges you see for the current dynamic? And I think particularly given what I mentioned about the rates, and you're seeing the flattening of the yield curve as well, yields in 10-year treasuries dropped again below 3%. The two 10-year spread is at the lowest level it's been in like 10 years since the Greenspan conundrum. I mean, how concerning are these things? That, for me, the 210 is the most sort of, of all the statistics I've seen, the most sort of meaningful. Yeah, well, the system, financial system, currently looks very odd. If you look at the surface, you can say, well, equity markets are still very high. Credit spreads are very tight. Everything right now is very calm. I mean, there was a few dramatic wobbles earlier this year, but it's you know still basically pretty good. Asset prices are still very high. Everything looks pretty calm in spite of the trade tensions. But if you start delving underneath the surface, there are a lot of relationships that appear to be breaking down in terms of asset prices and things like the credit curve flattening and inverting even in some markets is very, very strange. I would argue what's really going on is that you have a financial system that's been flooded with a lot of money where investors have lost their ability to discriminate a lot of credit risks because they've become so used to this tidal wave of money from quantitative easing and where what they think is normal is actually a very artificial situation. And as money gets pulled out of the system through the shrinking of the Fed's balance sheet, as the Fed starts to raise rates, as things like the repatriation of overseas holdings by American corporations takes place, you have the potential in the next year for a lot of financial flows to occur, which may have some quite unexpected impacts. So I think it's going to be very hard to exit from this rather abnormal situation calmly. Mm. And plus, of course, you've got this US economy, which is pumped up with this kind of sugar high of tax cuts. And where, you know, essentially, the chance of a slowdown in the next two years is quite high. 
even as the fiscal stimulus is due to run off in two years, and even as, of course, the Fed is currently intent on raising rates. And that's been the the sort of argument, right? I mean, the Fed, when they flooded the system with liquidity, central banks generally, the argument was, we have to do it now. Okay, fine. But the, there was a, an additional point that was made by central banks, whether they believed it or whether they wanted to create confidence, was that they'd be able to to unwind this balance sheet. It wouldn't be that difficult. We got in easy, we can get out easy. You're touching on one area that sort of feeds off of what you're saying is emerging markets, right? You're talking about a potential change in market regime as a matter of not just the actual liquidity, but the liquidity that was put into the system created a sort of placidity in the market. Investors lost their ability to discriminate. They sort of loaded up on beta. A lot of the alpha-driven investors sort of left the market. You also have a lot of these ETFs, you know, wind up easy again, unwind, can unwind very violently. It seems to me that this area is Because there have been so many people that have been ringing the alarm bell for so many years in this space, that also, I guess, kind of feeds into what you're saying about people just getting used to it. I guess the thing that's the most concerning about it, though, is the fact that the central banks don't have the balance sheet capacity to, and I think also the confidence of the public to do what they did in 2008 all over again. Do you think that they would be able to enact roughly the same sort of measures and do it successfully in the event that we had a contraction? And do we even need to do it, given the fact that the interconnectivity in the banking system has changed and we don't necessarily face a financial crisis in the event of a major equity drawdown? Well, the Fed certainly has the space to cut rates a bit if there was a slowdown. And it is shrinking its balance sheet now very slowly. They're scaling back the degree to which they want to shrink it overall. And it's now well established within Fed circles that you can use balance sheet management as a perfectly, you know, seemingly normal tool of monetary policy. So I don't think they'd have any problems with expanding the balance sheet again if they needed to. What's far more controversial is whether the Fed or the Treasury would ever be allowed to move to bail out a financial system again if there was another crisis. And, you know, people like Ben Bernanke and Hank Paulson, who were all sort of luminaries of the financial crisis back in 2008, you know, they are very explicit in saying that they are very concerned these days that many of the tools that they used to fight the last financial crisis have been removed by Congress, and they're no longer deemed to be acceptable by the American political body. In Europe, it's actually in some ways a harder situation, because in Europe they have less fiscal space, arguably, because you need to get political agreement amongst all the governments to do something. And, I mean, individual companies can raise taxes or cut taxes as they want, but it's just much harder politically to use fiscal measures than it has been in the U.S. And, of course, the ECB hasn't really started tightening, so there isn't the same level of wiggle room that you've got in the U.S. now. So if a crisis happened in Europe today, I think in some ways it would be even harder for the Europeans to actually act and bail out the system or even do even more radical monetary policy measures. So you made a really good point there, which is that there's this consensus view that they can expand the balance sheet. It's not really a problem. And I think that that has something to do with their narrow definition of inflation, right? So the central banks have been focused on consumer price inflation, but we've seen inflation. We've just seen it in asset prices. And that inflation in asset prices has had a direct effect on wealth distribution, right? And that wealth distribution has also had an effect on politics and populism. And we're seeing perhaps in some of these other areas, like in our politics and in our trade, the impact of monetary policy, of regulations, of economic policy. And I wonder, and, I, and I'm curious your thoughts on this, if we might not see the sort of volatility that we haven't seen in markets show up in politics, as we're already beginning to see, and also in geopolitics. And are we beginning to see the change in the international order and the change in the politics of individual countries and the sort of the breakdown of this traditional order, is that going to lead to a, over time, a new volatile world where the sort of misallocation of capital is going to result in wealth destruction from a breakdown of global trade, war perhaps? And I don't mean this like in an alarmist sense, but just in a very realistic sense. Well, I think you raise a very interesting point there. And to me, one of the most telling indications that you know, you're onto something there is that Ray Dalio, who runs Bridgewater, the world's biggest hedge fund, has spent most of his career looking at financial flows and economic numbers. And he was one of the few people who actually predicted the last credit crisis, really on the back of his very numbers-driven econometric analysis of credit flows. But these days, what Dalio spends most of his time looking at is political trends and geopolitics. And he produced a fascinating index of populism, 
last year, which tried to measure what percentage of the Western vote had gone to populist anti-establishment candidates in the last 150 years. And what that shows is that from 2010 to 2017, there was a jump from about 5% to about 35-40% in the Western world of the share of the vote that's gone to populist candidates. And that, I should say, was before the Italian elections. And it's a really big jump. There's only one time in history you can see that kind of jump, and that was in the 1930s. And so if you think that risk has moved from the financial sphere into the political sphere, and that's where the volatility is going to be, you can actually see evidence of that in the charts and numbers already. So you mentioned Ray Dalio. Another thing I was curious to ask you is, given the fact that I mentioned at the very beginning, you're the most... Again, it's an honest compliment. You're the best financial interviewer I've ever, I think, that we have. I wish you would do more stuff on television. And you speak to so many people off the record. Forget what you do on the record. I'm very curious, who are some of the most interesting, maybe interesting is too soft a word, the smartest, most sort of prescient, uh, creative thinkers that you come across? And who do you think sort of has some of those most interesting ideas to share that you've, again, that you've come across? Wow. Um, I'm not going to give away all my trade secrets about who I think is you know, smart and bright, um, because I'll probably offend all the ones I don't actually mention. Well, well, how can we state it in a different way? I mean, I'm very curious about this. I mean, it would be really insightful, I think, for me in the audience to know who you listen to, particularly. I listen to a wide range of people. I mean, you know, Ray Dalio is very smart. There are many other very smart financial gurus and titans who get essentially paid to read the markets. There are people who, you know, I try to expose myself to different points of view. I don't find it, don't do it nearly as much as I should do. And one of my biggest regrets is the degree to which I tend to get trapped into intellectual bubbles and, you know, professional bubbles myself. But, you know, over the years, I've got very smart tips from all over the place. One of the people who I will just give a shout out to who helped me to see the financial crisis coming back in 2007 was a very wonderful Japanese official who worked at the Central Bank of Japan, who I'd known a full decade earlier, who'd been at the heart of the Japanese financial crisis. And I stayed in touch with him over the years, and he gave me some very smart tips just before the American financial crisis about the parallels between Japan and America. So, you know, I've tried to draw lessons from all over the world. Well, that makes sense, of course, because the crisis we encountered in 2008 had many similarities to the Japanese deflation. Absolutely, and I think it's got many similarities to China as well right now going forward. Are you concerned about China? Um, We mentioned the thing about the corporations. The Chinese government has allowed Chinese corporations and China generally to generate tremendous amounts of debt. So much of that has gone to construction and real estate. Is that a concern? China is fascinating because in so many ways its path mirrors that of Japan three decades earlier, where you basically had an economy that grew very rapidly on the back of a bank-centered financial system, government in the case of China, government controlled, in the case of Japan, government influenced, and where essentially you had cheap money going to build up industries very fast, build on export, and a system that wasn't very good at allocating credit on any graded or subtle concept of risk. The Chinese have been frantically trying to learn from the history of Japan what not to do in terms of reforming their system. And more recently, they've been trying to learn from the Americans who were you know, at the heart of the financial crisis about how to avoid a financial crisis. Again, going back to Bernanke and Geithner and Paulson, they've all been in long conversations with the Chinese about how not to have an American-style financial crisis. But the reality is that China today has a massive amount of debt. It has an economy which is moving from a bank-centered government-controlled system to a more liberal capital market. It's definitely got a lot of bad debts in the system, which the government could absorb, and write off if it wanted to, but may not be able to do that easily. And the thing that Japan shows is that when you have big, big debt borrowings and bad debts, you can cope with that if there's inflation and growth. But if there's ever deflation and a recession, it becomes much harder. And of course, the demographics are different now than they were for the Japanese at the time, right? I mean, the Japanese demographics, I don't know what they were, but they weren't median age 38 when they had their crash in 89, were they? No, the Chinese have terrible demographics compared to the Japanese. And in fact, they're on a par, if not worse, than a lot of Western countries too. 
And that's another big worry for the Chinese. And they have the environmental factors. And on top of that, you mentioned the sort of the pandemics, the antibiotic resistance, the cyber attacks, the interconnectivity. Jillian, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And I, I know our audience will have appreciated the conversation. I wish we could have had more time. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. And that was my episode with Jillian Ted. I want to thank Jillian for being on my program. For more information about today's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you're a regular listener to the show, take a moment to review us on Apple Podcasts. Each review helps more people find the show and join our amazing community. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. <laughs>